Lord, reverence and open up our hearts today. Father, we thank you that we get to come into your house tonight, Lord, that we get to come and to hear from you, Lord. We fully acknowledge that the reason that we are here today is because of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we come to hear from your word. So Lord, I pray that as we open up your word, Lord, I pray as we look into what you have for us today, Lord, that it's your word, it's your Holy Spirit that inspires us, that speaks to us, that teaches us, that leads us and guides us into what you have, into your truth and your path and your purpose for our lives. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the honor for what you will do in us. And Lord, we thank you that we get to come into this house to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that as each and every one of us come and hear from you, I pray that we would leave tonight better than when we came because of you, because of your goodness, because of your grace, because of your love, and because of your Holy Spirit in us. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, amen. amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Luke in the 17th chapter. I'm going to just start right off the bat, and I'll give you the title in just a moment. But I want to just take you to uh, a, a section of Scripture that, that I was reading. And I kind of just, every morning I get up and I read a little bit out of the Bible, and I read some devotionals, and I spend some time in prayer. And a couple of weeks back, this is something that I was just reading. And I thought it was just something that kind of jumped out at me. And we'll look at this. And this is a, a section of Scripture in Luke, the 17th chapter. I'm just going to read verse number 20 and 21. Or excuse me, yeah, verse number 20 and 21. Uh, in Luke chapter 17. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me. If not, we'll put it up on the screens behind me and on the sides. But Luke chapter 17, verse number 20, the text for today that we're going to look at says this. It says, now when he, Jesus, the speaking of Jesus, now when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered to them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed... The kingdom of God is within you. Today, I want to focus and look at that subject. See, Jesus has a central theme from the beginning of his ministry all the way up until he died on a cross. For three years, Jesus had a ministry season. And the most talked about subject that Jesus discussed was not salvation, was not healing, was not uh, 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 Israel's restoration into a great nation. It was the subject of the kingdom of God. Or you could even say it like this, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, before Jesus ever came, there was his cousin John who would say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so Jesus came and this was the central topic to his ministry time here on earth was to discuss the subject of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He would use those phrases interchangeably. One thing we need to understand about the kingdom of heaven is that it's not something that you and I arrive to after we die. So often, I think, as Christians, we think that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is this, this realm somewhere far in a distant place that once we have lived on this earth, that we will pass through some cosmic force or cosmic veil and enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the reality is, is that it's not some distant realm. It is a present reality. That is what the kingdom of heaven is. It is a present reality of the authority of God in existence in your life, on earth today, everywhere about us. And so when we understand that this is the central theme and the central idea of what Jesus wants us to understand, that it's not about what happens when you die. That's great, that's important, and that is huge to God. But God wanted to understand something, wanted you and I to understand something, that he sent Jesus Christ to bring his kingdom here to us today. And so as Jesus talks about this great subject of this realm or this, this reality of authority, those who didn't believe him oftentimes were called the, the, the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes. And what they were was just a political or uh, aristoc aristocracy group of religious leaders of the time. They didn't necessarily believe that Jesus had a message or believe in Jesus' message. And this was one of those times when basically they come to Jesus and they say, when will this kingdom that you oh so frequently talk about show itself? And I think it was such an interesting thought that they asked Jesus. What I find even more interesting is how Jesus responds to them. See, Jesus says to them, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God does not come with uh, observation. You see, the Jewish people at the time of Jesus were eagerly searching and waiting and anticipating a Messiah. The word 
Christ is a Messiah or a Savior. Now their viewpoint, their vision, their ideas was somebody that would save them not from a spiritual oppression, but from a physical oppression from the Roman Empire and the people that had come before the Roman Empire to be a restored nation unto themselves once again. And so as they see this rabbi, so to speak, traveling and speaking and teaching on this subject of the kingdom of God, it being at hand and being present and being uh, 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 with us today, they say, when is this season going to come? Because they were looking, they were searching, they were seeking. And it's on that very thought that I want to talk to you today about what are you, where is it? Where is it? I think of it like this. I have a massive problem. Probably one of, and, and this is my biggest source of contention that I'm okay, but I don't think it's my biggest source, but it's probably one of the greatest source of contentions I have in life is that I lose everything. Like everything. Like I lose a shoe, just one shoe. I'll lose one shoe. I'll lose, I'll lose clothes. I'll have clothes. I have no clue where they go. Like, I, I really do believe that the dryer eats things. I absolutely believe that. I lose everything. My wife is on the front row. And it, I, I'm sure it just drives her nuts. But the biggest thing is my phone, my wallet, and my keys. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, literally every day, I lose one of them at least once. And most of my day is spent trying to find my phone, my wallet, or my keys. And I've tried to consolidate my phone and my wallet into one small thing so that I could spend, I could try to cut out some time searching for it. I, I'm telling you, if I'm not careful, if I'm not choice about what I do with my things when I come home, I have a routine. I have a very certain particular spot that when I come home, my keys go. If my keys don't go there, it will take me days, sometimes weeks, to find where they went. I have found keys in sock drawers. I have found keys at my neighbor's house. I have, I have my friends in other cars have, have called me and said, I think I have your keys. I have found them in all areas of the house, under the couch, in the cushions, in rooms that I don't even go into. I've even found my keys in the refrigerator. No joke. I have a really big problem. And part of the big contention is that how much time and energy I exhaust looking and searching. I tear everything apart. And you know, if you've ever lost something, especially, you know, you don't generally, especially with your keys, you don't realize that you've lost them until you needed them. And generally you needed them like five minutes prior to actually needing them because you're out, because we live in California. And so you're probably out the door, you're already late and you needed your keys like 10 minutes ago. And so there's all this stress and anxiety on the top of it and you're tearing everything apart. And like for me, I'm just, you know, I get to that like table flipping thing. Like, well, Jesus turned over the table, so I figured it was okay. But, you know, you kind of get into that, like, table flipping mode of, like, the couch. You just take it and, like, rip all the cushions off. And, like, there's this, like, Tasmanian devil wake of things that, like, when I lose my keys. And then my wife's just like, what did you put them? Where did you put them? Where's the last? I don't know if I knew that I would have them. What did you do with them? What did you do with them? And so finally, finally, eventually you find them or you find that spare, spare set. And it's worse when you've lost the spare and then you figure, I don't need the spare because I have the, and then you've lost both. And then you just don't drive your car for a week because that's happened also. So, but the most frustrating of all endeavors when I lose my keys is when I've gone touring, tearing through the house trying to find my keys. Mad at my wife, Stacy, she said something to me and generally it has kind of a smart connotation. Well, if you just put them where, you know, and it's just like, I don't need that now. So that we get in a big fight and I'm yelling at the kids and everything's going, is when I realize that they're in my pocket. <laughs> Has anybody ever been there before? Look at you. See, look at that. You are not alone, people. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever for you and I. I literally think that if my head was not attached to my neck, I would have forgotten that long ago. But I say that because I think in many of our cases, we do exactly that with God. And that's exactly what the Pharisees, who were questioning Jesus out of a position of doubt, were doing. They were searching, 
They were tearing apart. Their eyes were always looking. They were yearning. They were asking God, where are you? Why aren't you here? Why isn't anything happening? What is going on? What is happening, God? You said you would come. You said you would have a, a Messiah. You said you would deliver us. And they're looking and they're looking and they're looking and they're looking. And they ask the one, the one, when is this all going to happen? And his response to them is, it doesn't come because you search and because you seek and because you tear apart the crevices of your life and you go to God and say, where is it? When is it? Why isn't it? It doesn't come like that, he says. He says, it's already here. And not, is it, not only is it already here, he says it's within you. Verse number 21. Now, most every other translation describes the word within your midst. Because if you think about it like this, these were people who didn't believe Jesus. They were questioning him from a place to try, to try to back him into a corner. And so Jesus wouldn't tell somebody who didn't believe him that the kingdom of heaven was in them because the kingdom of heaven is in those who believe. But the word, the Greek words for within you literally means inside and you, but it could also be translated in your midst. And so Jesus is telling these unbelievers that the kingdom of heaven is not something that you look for in a far distance that will arrive someday. The kingdom of heaven is already here in your midst. You just can't see it because you're too busy looking for it. Now, what I think is amazing is that it does have a double meaning because Jesus' disciples were listening at the same time. And I do think that Jesus intended for this to, to, to reign true in their hearts that the kingdom of heaven is within you. Because later on they asked Jesus, Jesus, what do you mean? And he says, it's like chasing a lightning bolt. You can't say, hey, the lightning's going to be over here. Because the moment you go to where the lightning bolt was, it's going to be over here. It won't happen like that. But it's within you. And I think that so often in our lives, because we are asking God, God, why aren't you going to do something in my life? When you look at somebody and maybe, maybe they've advanced further in their walk with God and you see that God's given them amazing and great and deep revelations and you're kind of wondering, God, where's my revelation? Where's my timing? Where's, where's my word? Where's my promise fulfilled? I, I, I see that their kids and their family are saved and I'm still praying for mine. And, and, and why isn't this happening? And we start to look, what's going on? Well, maybe it's the church that I'm going to. Maybe it's not good enough. Or maybe it's, maybe it's the preacher. Maybe it's the music. I need to listen to the music. And where's the next move of God? And you know what? I see that there's something going on over here and there's this big revival happening over there and let's chase it over there and, and, and let's go over here and let's look over here and let's look over there and let's do this and all of a sudden we get so wrapped up doing exactly what the Pharisees did that we overlook and we see beyond what Jesus Christ is saying is that it's so subtle that it doesn't come because you're looking for it it comes because it is within you and I know in my own life and if we're just honest if we're just real I'm sure that you feel the same way there are things and there are areas of my life where I say God I'm waiting God, why haven't I felt you? Why haven't I experienced you? Why haven't I seen you? Why haven't you moved? Why haven't you healed? Why haven't you, why haven't you finished? Why haven't you removed this? Why haven't you brought this? Why haven't you? Why, why, why? Where, where, where? When, 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 God, will you show up? And I think that Jesus is saying something so important. It's on that subject of where is it? Where is the kingdom of heaven to us? Where is the kingdom of God to us? Is it something that we compartmentalize to a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday morning? Is it something that we use and utilize only when we need it because we're in duress or in having hardships? Or is it something that is all about us and in within us? Because Jesus has a central theme about this kingdom being within you and I. And Jesus says these words, and I'm going to kind of focus on this thought for this, this, this evening. Jesus says these words to his disciples. These are some of the last words in the book of John that he records for you and I about Jesus before he's about to go to the cross, and this is after a great supper that they've had together, and Jesus gives this beautiful analogy of a, of a vine dresser or a gardener, and a vine or a vineyard and grapes. And so you think about it like that. And Jesus says that God is the great vine dresser. Jesus says, I am the vine. And he says, you are the grapes, the branches, the shoots. And, I, and he goes on and he talks about this subject. And in John 15, 5, Jesus says to his disciples, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. 
And I think when we look at Luke 17 and we look at John 15, 5, we might struggle to say, what on earth do they have to do with each other? But I think it's the central undertone of what Jesus is speaking into our lives. Is that so often we try to do things based on our own ability. Sometimes we're so focused on results because that's our culture. That's our society. That's our world that we live in. That if you're not seeing instantaneous results, if things aren't changing on a daily basis, that something is missing and something is wrong. And then we start to look, where is it? What is it? Why isn't it? And Jesus gives a very implicit rule here that he is the source of life for you and I. Jesus says it like this, that he is the way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one goes to the Father except through me. But in John, the 15th chapter, he paints this image. And he says something so amazing. He says that I am the vine. I am the source. I am the, 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 all that you get everything from. You are an offshoot, a branch from me. And that if you want to be successful, which I would say every one of us in life wants to experience success, not only success in our relationships and success in our finances, but also success in this subject, in the context of God's great kingdom and God's purpose for our lives. I want to rule and reign in this life spiritually with the authority that Jesus says I should have. And Jesus says, if you want to experience success in life, there's a key to it. It's this word abide. That word abide means to remain in. My dad used to teach it like this, to live, stay, and dwell. And Jesus says, if you will remain in me, but I love this, and look at this, and I in you. You remember what he said in Luke, the 17th chapter? The kingdom of heaven is in you. And he says, if you would abide, if you would remain, if you would live, if the source of your life would culminate and come from this place of living, of being, in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit in life. But then he goes on and he adds this negative. And he says, but without me, you can do nothing. I think it's so important to see what Jesus is saying. And I think it's important to see what he's not saying. Because I went through this, this afternoon and, and I heard a preacher recently talk about this. And it just rocked my thought process. And I, I just wanted to share it with you today as well. And what Jesus is saying and what he's not saying. You see, Jesus is saying, if you look at, you can keep it up on the screen because I'm going to talk about it for a moment. What Jesus is saying is saying, without me, you can do nothing in the New King James. And the King James says, without me, you can do nothing. In the English Standard Version, which is the version I read out of him at home, he says, without me, you can do nothing. In the New Living Translation, which is kind of a more modern day, Eng modern English translation, it says, for without me, you can do nothing. The New International Version says, guess what it says? Without me, you can do nothing. What is Jesus saying? Without him, you can do nothing. But here's what I want to emphasize. He did not say, without me, you can't do anything. Jesus said, without me, you can do. You can do. It's your life. You can do anything you want to do. You can spend your life looking for anything you want to look for. You can give your time to anything you want to give your time to. You can build your business. You can build an empire. You can build relationships with friends. You can give your life to the greatest of social causes here on earth. You can do anything. But Jesus says, but without me, it's nothing. It's nothing. And I think what's so important and so impacting to me as when we look at statistics, and I'm a statistics guy, I'm a news guy, every morning I wake up and I, need for, I read from a news source some news articles about what's going on in Asia, what's going on in Europe, what's going on in Africa, what's going on in America, what's going on in South America, I want to know what's going on around the world. 
And when we look at what's happening, and we look at what's going on, and we look at the church in the middle of all of this, we begin to wonder why. Why is the church losing its voice? Why are Christians not uh, speaking up why is when we speak up now, it dwindles in the opinions and then the views of our culture around us? And to me, I believe, and I can't say that this is factual, but I believe in my heart that because a lot of us today as followers of Jesus are so focused on doing that we have forgot about being. And the world can do a lot. There's a lot of social justice causes that are amazing. There's a lot of charities that are wonderful. There's a lot of, uh, you know, human rescue efforts that are taking girls out of the sex trade every day and giving them a great life. But can I tell you something? Without Jesus, eternity never changes. And it all equals nothing. And when the church gets wrapped up in doing, and we're all about what are we doing, then we miss the fundamental thing that Jesus Christ is talking about, and that is a position of being. Now, being doesn't mean doing, obviously, because Jesus says, if you want to be successful, be in me. And I will be in you. And you will. You said you might. You should. He said you will bear much fruit. But if I look at my own life. And some of the areas. And some of the seasons. And some of the places that I look at God. And I say God where are you? God why am I not hearing your voice? God why, why am I not experiencing your presence like I so desire? I find so often now when I look at my own life. And my own time. How it's spent. I spend a lot of time doing very little time being. You see, most of us, and if we're honest, let's just be honest, let's be real, and like cut through all the, the, the charades. Most of us spend our time being with God right here. But if you were married to somebody and you spent 30 minutes a week being with that person only and ignoring them, compartmentalizing them into another place of your life until they make out or they, they, they work out for your benefit. No other relationship on earth would ever survive that. And Jesus says this word abide. Because abide doesn't mean come to church and hear a pastor preach and that's all you get out of it. Abide means remain. It means stay in. It means be a part of. I think William Shakespeare really knew what he was talking about when he wrote the play Hamlet. To be or not to be? That is the question. Because so many of us are like the Pharisees and nobody would ever want to be called a Pharisee. Nobody would ever want to be associated with a corrupt religious aristocracy. But if we look at the actions of our lives, if we look at what we do with our days and with our times, most of us are in it for the authority, for the title, and for the blessings that come with it, rather than just simply being connected to the vine. That's so good. And then we say, God, where's our voice? God, where's our impact? God, why is our family not being changed? Why is everybody around us not seeing anything happen in us? And God says, because you are so focused on doing that you have forgotten to be. To be. Because I believe that God wants us to live in a life with margin. What is margin? Margin is space. You have margins on a paper, right? You have margins. In financial worlds, businesses operate on what's called margin. And that's the difference of what comes in and what goes out. There's always a margin. If you have no margin in your business, well, you probably know. You're living on credit. It's not a good place. But God has called and destined his people. He says it. You want to be successful? Be connected to the vine. If you live your life connected, if you are so focused on just being, then doing will naturally happen to you. Because you will have all the sustenance and all the nutrients and all the resource and everything you could possibly ever need in life will come from me if you'll just 
abide. And we want to live in a place of margin. Jesus says it like this. He says, I am the river of life. He says, come and drink from me to the woman at the well. He says, man, you drink from me and you will never run out. I'll tell you, for me, I got tired of scraping the bottom of the barrel every time I had to talk about Jesus to somebody. Like, oh, what was, what was that message that the pastor preached on Sunday? Maybe I'll share that with somebody. And rather I said, you know, God, I'm so exhausted from trying to do, do, do that all I need to do is just sit back and be. Spend some time with him. Spend some time in prayer. Spend some time reading. Spend some time listening to worship music. You know, I was just thinking about it today. At home, I have the base package of, of television. I have 183 channels. 183 channels. I have 75 megabits of internet up and down, which means I could watch YouTube all day and Netflix all day and Hulu all day and radio all day. And I have all these things that seek for my time. And the question I ask myself is how much of my time do I give to God to say, here I am just to be? Just to be. I'm not here to study for a message. I'm not here to pray for my needs. I'm not here to, to ask and beg and plead for what's around the corner. Like that song says, I'm just going to sit for these couple of minutes and just be. I'm going to read my Bible just to read my Bible. I'm going to pray just to pray. I'm going to turn on worship music just to worship. And it's in those times, it's in those seasons, it's in those moments I find that God holds true to exactly what John chapter 15 verse 5 says. That if you just remain, you just hang out, if you just live in this place, I will give you margin in life. That you're no longer scraping the bottom of the barrel trying to figure out what am I doing in this walk with Christ. But you are overflowing with life. That when people look at you, they look at you and they say, what is happening to you? You could say, it's margin. <laughs> margin? What are you talking about? Because I'm overflowing. I have space. I could stretch out. I'm not wondering what's going to happen. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen because no matter if anything happens, I have everything I need in Jesus Christ. My encouragement to you, it's so simple, it's so easy, it's so uncomplex. It's probably boring, but just be with Jesus. Just be with Jesus. You know, I remember I was a sophomore, no, I was a junior in high school. Mom and Dad bought a 1996 Chevy Blazer. It was forest green, and it was like the car. I had this 19, what was that, Dad? 83 Datsun? Was it 83, 80, something like that, right? Really old. It was like right when Nissan and Datsun had, had merged, and so like you couldn't even tell what it was. It was a Datsun or it was a Nissan. People were like, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. It's cheap. I had this truck. We fixed it up. It was the old church work truck, and then after that, Mom and Dad had this 1996 Chevy Blazer with 4x4 and growing up in Ukaipa, I mean, it was just like, it was so cool. And I got to drive that to school every day. I remember I got into school, and my responsibility of driving the Chevy Blazer was put gas in it when it needs gas. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so I got up that morning, and I, was, I had to pick up some friends from school, and we all kind of worked together, and so I would drive by and pick up people's houses, or by, drive by people's houses and pick them up. And I remember I had a quarter of a tank, a quarter of a tank, and I'm a, I'm a numbers geek, right? So I'm like, all right, there's, there's 22 gallons in a tank, and this gets like 16 miles to the gallon, so that means I can go like 276 gallons, or 276 miles, and okay, so if I've got a quarter of a tank, that means that I've got like six gallons left, and that means, you know, I'm doing all the math, right? I'm trying to push it to the limit. I remember we were driving down a hill, I was driving down a hill, and I stopped at the stop sign, headed downwards, and I guess the way that that, that Chevy Blazer worked is it sucked gas out of the back side of the tank and not the front side of the tank. And so as I was driving, because all of the gas was in the front and the entrance to the gas was in the back of the tank, all of a sudden the truck just went blah, 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 and died. I ran out of gas with a quarter of a tank left. It's like, what a design flaw is that? 
You know what I think, though, is that's us. That's us. Because we got just enough on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening. We got just enough on a Wednesday night. We came to church one time, and we heard the pastor preach, and it moved us, and I got those goosebumps during the music, and the light show was amazing, and I saw God's Shekinah glory, and it's actually just smoke, but whatever. And it's just enough to start, but there's not enough margin. There's not enough left over in the tank that when something actually comes our way, when something actually happens, we say, man, I've got overflowing because Jesus does not want you to live life empty and dull. He wants you to live life vibrant and full. But that comes from a position in a place of being. And when you be, when you focus on living and dwelling and staying in the presence of God and allowing your heart to remain connected to God in what you're doing in life, then it will begin to overflow in other areas of your life. And no longer will the kingdom of heaven be compartmentalized into one little tiny space. But you will realize that it is a reality that when you walk out of the door of your house, you can see that the kingdom of heaven is truly at hand and you are a vessel in it to reveal God's goodness, his glory, his mercy, his grace, his love, his desire for people to be a part of what you're a part of. But that doesn't come because you do. It comes because you be. And I think about it. Jesus sent his disciples out. But what is a disciple? A disciple is somebody That's not just been trained. They didn't go to school every Monday through Friday for five hours a day with Jesus with a whiteboard. Now, children, here it is. A disciple walked with Jesus. A disciple ate with Jesus. They they, they slept next to Jesus when he slept. Where he went, they went. They, They were around him when he prayed. They were with Jesus. And then Jesus says to his 12 disciples, he says... I want you guys to go with me, with the presence of God. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to preach the kingdom of heaven and heal the sick. And he sends them out because of their presence, because of being around, because they've absorbed what they saw with Jesus. They come back and they say, Jesus, we're amazed at what happened. We're amazed we saw people healed. We saw lives completely restored. People heard our words and they, 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 they hear your message and they're following you. And Jesus is great. And then he has this miracle. You know, Jesus is like, cool, let's, let's put the icing on the cake. And he multiplies fish and loaves and he feeds 5,000 people just to kind of be like, here, here you go. See, like, surprise, what you can do with me. And then shortly after that, he expands it. And he sends out 72 more disciples. He says, all right, y'all saw what happened with the twelve. Now I want you guys to go. And he says, what do do you guys go and do? I want you to go and teach about the kingdom of heaven and heal the sick. That's what he says to do. And then they come back to Jesus and they say, Jesus, I can't believe it. The demons are subject to, I mean, we're walking in towns and demons are jumping out of people left and right. And we're seeing people get up and get healed. And we're seeing all these things. And Jesus, I could just imagine his face. He's looking at them like, man, that's so cool. That's so awesome. I know. (laughs) And then he says these words in Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke, the 10th chapter, he says these words. And I'm going to skip Matthew and I'll come back to it, guys, in the back. I kind of went out of order. Luke, the 10th chapter, Jesus says, behold, I give you the authority. I've given it to you. You see, when you abide, you have it. But when you go and try to do it on your own, you're you're on your own. You can do anything you want to do. But without Jesus, you can do nothing. It's nothing. But Jesus says, with me, you've gone. You've been with me. You've experienced it. And I sent you out and you saw it. I give you the authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt you. I can see the disciples are doing that little Pentecostal jig. You know, they're like, yeah, right? But then he says this, he says, nevertheless, chill out on the, jo- on the dance. Because that's not even why I want you to dance. He says, don't rejoice in that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. 
You see, our culture, our world is not looking for sages any longer. Because everybody's a sage nowadays. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has an opinion. My goodness, go watch a day's worth of YouTube and you will be an expert on anything. You'll be able to change your own brakes, fix your own car, build your own house, design the next space shuttle, for goodness sakes. This is the age of information and we have an overload of information, but we are starving for authenticity. And I find it so interesting that Jesus cares less about what we do and more about who we are. Being. Being. As a matter of fact, he takes it one little step further. At the end of his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, the seventh chapter, Jesus is talking. And he says these words. He says, many will say to me in the day, the final day, Lord, Lord, have we not, look at that, prophesied. In your name? Have we not spoke your word and your will and your... What's going to happen? Have we not seen this in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done many wonders in your name? Stay there. Matthew 22, 722. Before we go, if you already got your Bible, you already know where we're going to go with this. But just recall, I'm not going to have him go there, but just stay here on the screen. John 15, 5. Jesus says, without me, you can do. You can do. They did. Look what they did. Works. Lots of good works. Lots of great things. You can do, but it's all nothing. Because he says in the, end of the next verse, in 723, he says, I will declare to them, I am. Never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. What an amazing thing Jesus said. We could have all the social justice in the world. We could have all the answers to the economic systems in the world. We could help out a fellow brother and sister who's in need and less fortunate than us all day. We can do all sorts of great things. But without Jesus, it's nothing. Because he is so more concerned about you being than he is about you doing. And the Pharisees who asked Jesus, when will this, when will this kingdom of heaven show up? Jesus says, you are so concerned with doing so you don't even realize that this all comes about by being by spending time with God by turning off the television and reading your Bible a devotional or praying and listening to worship music by actually developing a relationship. We say all the time in church, this is about a relationship, not a religion. But how many of us really take time to develop a relationship outside of church service? And I think Jesus wants his church to know him deeper than we've ever known. To go further than we've ever gone before. From a position and a place of rest, like Pastor Jim's been talking about, and peace and positioning. My life is not based on what I do. My life is not based on the great things that I do because clearly we can do great things, but Jesus isn't even interested in that. My life is based on being. If I could just focus on being who God wants me to be, I will succeed. I will win. Right. Things will come out of me that I never recognize and realize that they will come out of me. You know, people ask me all the time, Pastor, how do you preach without any notes? I don't understand that. I see, these, I see everybody, they got their folders, and then you come up here and you just start talking. You know what I realized? I would preach all these great messages with all these great notes, and I'd go home and forget what I preached. 
People would be like, man, that message that you taught on Sunday night was amazing. And I'd be like, <laughs> what was it about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and then I realized for my own self, a place of being, that if I preach something that's not in me, <laughs> how could I ever expect it to be in you? But if you take the time to get it in you, it will naturally come out of you. And if you take the time in your life to allow Jesus to get in you, because the kingdom of heaven is within you. What is the kingdom of heaven? It's a reality of the spiritual authority and the position that you have today here on earth, a life of purpose and of meaning. And as you take the time to develop that by abiding, by remaining, by staying, then you will be successful in life because you will do great things. And then instead of, imagine for a moment, church, instead of looking at where the next great move of God is, we would realize that it's happening on the inside of us every day. That the church wouldn't have to pray for revival to come. Because every day we wake up in a spirit of revival. That God is reviving the life of Jesus Christ on the inside of us. Paul says in Romans the 8th chapter that the very spirit of God that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in your mortal bodies today. You can live in revival every day. But it doesn't come by looking and searching and seeking. It comes from being. Simply being. I'm going to finish on this. A couple of weeks ago, my kids, they just, I don't even know what they did, but they made me mad. <laughs> I got a six-year-old and a four-year-old. It's like, you're just constantly mad. They're always doing something. Whenever it's quiet in the house, something is wrong. Like, somebody's drawing on something or painting something that they shouldn't be painting or, 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 or what Emma's found mom's makeup and she's putting nail polish on her face because she thinks that it's makeup and now we have three days worth of scrubbing to get it off. Whatever it was, I don't remember. Bjorn, my son, he was so upset as I was driving him to school because dad was upset at him. He says, Dad, I'm really sorry that I let you down. And I said, Bud, you need to understand something. You don't have to do anything for me to love you. You don't have to do anything for me to be proud of. I'm proud of you simply because you're my boy. You're mine. God wants you to know you might be making some mistakes. You might be saying, I'm not where I think I should be. And I'm not where I know I should be. And I'm behind the curve in my walk with God. But God says, look, I love you. I'm proud of you. If you will abide in me and be my child, everything opens up to you. Church, I think that we've got to be stop focusing on how much we can accomplish in the matter of a day and start to look at how much can I spend with God of my day. Because if I could just be with God, then I will do things for God. I just got to sit this last week, and I've already said I'm going to close, and I'm going to close on this. i got two minutes and 40 seconds. I got to spend this last week, this Wednesday, we got to hear from an amazing woman of God, Darlene Che. Probably the most influential worship leader of the 21st century. Most of the songs that we sing in church are either inspired by her, <laughs> written, many of them written by her, or written by people that she has mentored as one of the greatest, most prolific worship leaders of our day. And somebody asked her, what is the one thing in all that you've done that you would tell somebody about what you've learned in your position? And she simply said this that I would come at it every day 
from a position of being and not doing. She said, I could get up on the stage and I can sing my heart out, but if I haven't done my worship before I got on that stage, if I didn't spend my time on my face before everybody else was on their face in worship, then I'm coming at it from the wrong place. Church, I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at today, be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. And watch everything else in your life fall into place. Because he says, if you're with me, abiding in me, you will bear much fruit. You won't even have to think about it. You won't even have to strategize about it. It'll just happen. Because God wants you to live in a place of margin, of space, of excess, of room to breathe and to grow. And that comes by being and not just doing.